Well, good morning, IEC. It is certainly good to be here with you this morning. My name is Pastor uh, Steve Winstead, and today we have the joy and privilege of wrapping up this glorious, short little epistle that Paul wrote, 104 verses, takes up about two and a half pages in your Bible. Today, we are going to finish the book of Philippians. We're going to finish this thank you note that Paul wrote to this church that he so loved there in Philippi. And as we close the book, I want to tell you what we're going to do today because it's a little bit different. We're going to go backwards and review the book and see what God has, to say, has said and remind us of what God has spoken to us throughout this book. And we'll finish with the last 10 verses of the book. There's some major themes in this book. Three of them I want us to highlight today. Three of them that I want us to sort of look backwards in review with these three main themes. The primary theme of this book is joy, to rejoice. What a beautiful calling upon the Christians. What a beautiful gift that God gives us is joy in Christ. A second major theme is unity, that we're called to unity. That we have unity in Christ. Though we here gather to worship God, come from various nations, various generations, various socioeconomic levels, we are one in Christ. And that's a beautiful, glorious thing that we can gather to worship. So unity. And thirdly, thanks. Thankfulness. That's literally what this book's about. It is a thank you note that Paul is writing to this church in Philippi. And it's such an example. This very book's presence is an example to us. That as Christians, we are to be very thankful and grateful people. So if you would please stand. We are going to read the last 10 verses. We'll be reading Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 23. So I invite you to turn there in your Bibles and stand for the reading of God's Word. If you don't have it, as always, it'll be on the screen behind me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and the glory in Christ Jesus. To God, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, praise be to God. You may be seated. Lord, your word says that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. Lord, unless you speak today, nothing of significance will be spoken, so speak, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, this book of Philippians is a special book. As I mentioned, Paul had a special love for this church. It was the first church he planted in Eastern Europe and would become a base of mission activity. I love that this church quickly not only embraced being a church and gathering as a body, but they instantly turned their eyes outward. They sent Paul, they supplied Paul, they sent a missionary. That's a beautiful thing. In fact, that's one of the things I deeply love about the beauty of IEC. You see, we're a unique church. We have people that have lived here their whole lives. We have people that move here as ambassadors. 
And then we have those who move here to serve as missionaries within this community, meeting needs, loving people. And we get to all gather together to worship, and it's a beautiful, glorious thing. But not only that, one of the areas I'm praying that God will continue to grow us in as a church is that we would send out missionaries from here, supporting them. It's one of the reasons I'm excited by the end of the year, we'll be sending out one of our own Beminent. He'll be moving to North Africa, he and his family. As a church, we get the joy of looking to the church in Philippi as a model. They sent out missionaries. We get to do the same. Even as we receive missionaries, we get to send them. I love that. And Paul loves this church. It's a beautiful church. Yet it started in a very unique way. Its start is recorded in Acts chapter 16. Paul, when he would show up in a city, he would typically go to the synagogue. And he would go to the synagogue and he would preach to the Jewish people who believed in the one true God. Well, they would hear it. Some would receive it. Many would reject it. A riot would often break out. Paul would be thrown in prison. And when he was released, he would gather those believers and start a church. That was Paul's church planning strategy. Go start a riot, get thrown in prison. When you're released, gather the believers. Yet Philippi was a unique city. Philippi did not have a Jewish synagogue. You see, to have a Jewish synagogue, you needed 10 Jewish men. Anywhere, any city where there was 10 Jewish men, you could start a synagogue. Yet Philippi was unique. You see, it was a Roman colony. Now that may not mean a lot to us, but to someone in the ancient world, to be from a Roman colony was a big deal. It means that you were literally a citizen of Rome of the highest order. You didn't have to pay Roman taxes. You were treated as a full citizen. And Philippi, Rome was strategic in setting Philippi as a Roman colony. You see, it was strategically located on the coast. It was a port city. And it was also a city that had been started by Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. And before the Romans ruled the world, the Greeks ruled the world. So the Romans wanted to set up within the Greek world an outpost so that they had control and power. So the city of Philippi was filled with soldiers, both active and retired. And it was filled with people that believed lots of things. Because you see, in the Roman Empire, you could believe anything you wanted to believe so long as you held to Caesar being God. Well, that created a problem for Judaism, for Jewish people, because they didn't believe Caesar was God. They believed there's one true God, so we don't see a synagogue there in Philippi. So Paul does what the Jewish people did when they were in captivity. In Psalm 137, when they were carried into captivity there in Babylon, they would go down by the river and weep. And Paul goes down to the river to weep and to mourn. And he finds a group of women praying, led by an Asian businesswoman named Lydia. And upon hearing the gospel, she trusts the Lord. Well, after that, there's a demon-possessed girl who, because of the demon, is able to foretell the future. And she begins to declare, Paul and Silas, these two men, they serve the Most High God. And she chases them around, speaking the truth of who they are. And finally, Paul casts the demon out of her, which makes her handlers quite angry because they can no longer make money. So Paul does end up in prison. Seems like that's a theme of Paul's life. Any place he goes, he eventually ends up in prison. And Paul ends up in prison, and it's there that they put him in the deepest recesses of the prison. And an earthquake occurs in the middle of the night. The prison collapses. Paul could escape. And as the Roman guard who's about to kill himself, because if, if prisoners escape on your watch for a Roman guard, you would be killed. As he's about to kill himself, Paul says, we're still here. We haven't left you. You're a precious soul made in the image of God. He declares the gospel to them, and the Roman soldier becomes a Christian. This is a, 
This church was almost started by accident, but look at how strategically God places just the right people in this church. In this city full of commerce and business, God places an influential businesswoman. In this city where people can believe all sorts of things, God places a girl who had formerly been controlled by an evil spirit. In this city full of Roman soldiers, God places a Roman soldier as a part of this church. So this church has a very unique start to it. It's a very unique church. Yet it's a great church. It's perhaps Paul's favorite church. He uses it as an example both in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and Romans 15. And now we're 10 years later. Paul started the church 10 years previous, and now 10 years later, Paul finds himself in prison in Rome, house arrest style prison. And when you're in house arrest prison, you need someone to come and take care of you. You need someone to supply food and to your basic needs. So the church in Philippi sends one of their elders, a man named Epaphroditus, to go and to take a gift to Paul. And we see at the beginning of this book, the first section, verse 1 through 11 of chapter 1, we see that Paul tells them, he gives a greeting as he always does. He says, Timothy is with him, which I always love. You read Paul's letters, it's not just Paul, it's Paul and. Paul is continually discipling continually investing his life into somebody intentionally. That's how he lives. You don't see it just being Paul. It's always Paul and, it's Paul and Timothy here. And he says he thanks God for their remembrance of him in verse three. Listen to what it says. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Two big themes come out right there. He thanks God, he's thankful. And this church, he finds joy in the Lord through this church there in Philippi. He rejoices in them. And he tells them this. He tells them that God is going to carry you on to completion. He says, God has started something in you. You see, we call, when we become a Christian, the theological word people would use is justification. Some would say it's just as if you've never sinned, which is true. You are justified before God. And all we do is receive the gift of eternal life that Jesus lived and that he was our substitute going to the cross in our place and we trust in that for salvation. That Christ paid the price. He's our substitute. And when that happens, we're what Scripture calls a new creation. We're born again. Yet, Paul tells us, and we're told throughout Scripture, that God will carry you on to completion. God's not finished with you. He's not finished with me. Isn't that great news? He's going to continue to sanctify you, yet one of the great paradoxes of sanctification is that God does the work and you do the work. It's all God, it's all you. Disciplined. Prayer. Seeking the face of the Lord, being in the Word, allowing God to grow and mature you. And Paul tells this church, hey, I'm thankful for you, and you're showing signs of maturity by giving to my needs, and God's going to keep growing you. Christian, we should long for maturity in Christ. We should desire, we should crave holiness to be more like Christ. That's one of the, the, the point of the Christian life is that we become more and more and more like Jesus Christ. That people see more of Jesus in us. Now in the next section, in section 12, in, in chapter 1, verse 12 through 26, Paul is going to begin to give a report of what's going on with him. He's in prison. We've spoken of that, but listen to what he says in verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. In verse 18, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Paul rejoices when Christ is proclaimed. And Paul says, I'm okay in prison. Knowing that the gospel is advancing 
that God is using this both for my good and for glory. And what we're going to see, one of the big ideas of this book that God teaches us. And if there's sort of one thing I would love for us as a church to walk away from more than any, with this, from this book more than anything else, is that our joy is not based on our circumstances. Come back to that over and over and over again. You quickly move from that. You quickly forget that. Our joy is not based on our circumstances. It's based on our relationship with Christ. And Paul, sometimes God gives us the blessing and the privilege of seeing how the pain and hardship in our life is used for his glory. Sometimes we will not see that until we enter into glory. But Paul gets a taste of that. You see, Paul's in prison. And 24-7, he has a guard chained to him. They're called the Praetorian Guard. And the Praetorian Guard, there's 9,000 of them in the Roman Empire. They are the highest ranking guards in Rome. In fact, they called them kingmakers. Because if they wanted the Caesar gone, they could get rid of Caesar. If they wanted a new Caesar in power, they could put him in power. They were more powerful than the Senate. And Paul, every six to eight hours a new guard shows up and is chained to Paul. And Paul has visitors. Paul always sings and praises God and speaks of the good news of the gospel. And these guards were hearing the gospel over and over and over again. In fact, by the end of the first century, there were more than 50,000 Christians living in Rome. And I believe that Paul's imprisonment had a big part of that. Remember, the, one of the last verses we just read a minute ago, Paul tells the church in Philippi that the, those in Caesar's household greet Paul, or greet the church in Philippi. Those in Caesar's household had never met the Philippians, but they were grateful for them. Why? Because the Philippians had sacrificed to help Paul. And can you imagine... That Roman guard, they're chained to Paul. Their next assignment, they go serve in the house of Caesar. And they start telling the other servants in the household of Caesar, I was just chained to this guy for my last assignment. And you should hear what he's saying about God. You should hear what he's teaching about this guy named Jesus Christ. You see, God used Paul's imprisonment both for Paul's good and, our, and for God's glory, and it's for our good. We get this book, Philippians, because Paul was in prison. Without Paul going to prison, we wouldn't have this book. So God can use those things that we don't understand in a powerful way. And Paul speaks of his view of life in 121, one of the most famous verses. He says, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul so found his joy in Christ that he would rather go be with Christ right now. I'm not there yet. I don't know if many of us are. But in our life, we should so increase our joy in the Lord. We, we find our joy increasingly in the Lord. And as that happens, we long to be with him more and more and more. And Paul says, I'd rather go be with the Lord right now. But to live, I'm going to live for Christ. It's what I'm here for. Let me tell you, that's why you're here. When you trusted in Jesus Christ, the most wonderful thing God could do is take you home to be with him forever in eternity. Because to be with him in glory is far greater than to be here. Yet God leaves us here for a reason to testify to his goodness, to testify to his glory. And Paul realizes that. That's why he says, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In chapter 1, verse 27, he turns his attention now to the church in Philippi. He starts to talk to them, and he's going to talk to them on these themes. Listen to verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy, worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. 
He tells the church, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Church, that should be our desire, that we live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has laid down his life for us to reconcile us to God Almighty. And our response is to live a life for his glory, worthy. And he says, stand firm in one spirit. He speaks to this idea of unity over and over again because this church, make no mistake, this is a great church. This church in Philippi is most likely the greatest church that Paul started. They were very healthy and doing well. Yet, don't forget this, they're not perfect. They've got issues. And know that there is no perfect church. As soon as you or I step through the door, any church ceases to be perfect because we're not there yet. No, there's no perfect church. There's only a perfect Savior. We look to Him. We are forgiven sinners gathered to worship our risen Lord. And I believe this church, I believe this with everything in me, I believe this is a great church. I believe this is a glorious church. I believe this, our, our church reflects where we're headed in Revelation, where every tribe, tongue, and nation gathers. We get a taste of that. We have people from different nations, different backgrounds, different generations. And you walk out that door and you don't see this. Because everybody wants to divide over their ethnicity, over their nation. They want to divide over their economics. Divide over everything we can divide over. But in the church, we are one in Christ. And it's a beautiful, glorious thing. We are to have a beautiful, glorious unity, and I praise God for that. We're not a perfect church. But I'll tell you, this is a great church. Because Jesus Christ is here. And he's been working here for many years through faithful saints. Just like we got to pray for one of our elders here today, Malusi from Zimbabwe. God has been faithful to raise up faithful men, faithful women to serve here, to lead and guide and shepherd this church. An enemy would love to divide us. He would rejoice to divide this church, to get us sideways with one another, to get us upset with one another, to get us speaking ill of one another. He would rejoice to divide. Because that's what the enemy always wants to do. But in the gospel, we find unity. In the gospel, there's a oneness. And this church in Philippi, their problem, it's revealed in chapter four, there's two women, Eudia and Syntyche, that are grumbling and complaining, causing problems. We're told they are believers. Their names are in the book of life. So these are two Christians fighting. They're not fighting over theological issues. We don't know what they're fighting over. But Paul doesn't correct their theology, so we know it's not that. No, there's something causing a division in this church, and Paul addresses it. And in chapter 2, look at what he says in chapter 2, verse um, th 2 and 3. He's going to speak to these issues. He says, complete my joy. So Paul has a joy. It adds to his joy when he sees the church living. He says, being of the same mind having the same love, being full of accord in one mind. Now, verse 3 is very hard. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Every time I come to chapter 2, verse 3, it short-circuits me. I, I just don't know what to do with it. I, I look at it and I go... Do nothing out of selfish ambition or rivalry. Humility, count others more significant. Uh, God, I can count others as significant. I, I, I believe other people, they're made in your image, God, they're significant. I can count others as worth and value and love them. But count them as more significant? You mean to lay down my rights and serve them more than I would even serve and take care of myself? That's our standard and our call to unity, that we live like this. And then Paul gives the greatest example of all. 
We read it in our opening, in our call to worship. Philippians chapter two, verse five, uh, chapter two, verse five through 11, where it says, your attitude, here's your attitude, Christian. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking on the very nature of a man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and in under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's our example. We're seeking to become like Christ. And none of us will ever be as high as Christ was in glory with God. And none of us will ever go as low as Christ did, taking on the wrath of God for the sins of the world. We'll never do that. But sometimes we lay down our preferences. What we, how we think things should be done. We lay things down for unity's sake in the body of Christ. I praise God that we're not a church like this. I've experienced a lot of churches where people will look for things to divide over all the time. Divide over music style. Divide over dress. Divide over this, divide over that. We like to divide over all sorts of things. No, we lay down our preferences. We unite in Christ. You see, church isn't primarily about me. I don't come to church to consume. It's not about me, it's about God. When I come to church, I come to worship Him. And if I can only worship God when the music is played a certain way, if I can only worship God when someone dresses a certain way, that says more about my relationship with God than it does anything about that church. You see, it's not about us. And Paul's pulling them toward unity. Count others more significant than yourselves. That's how we're to live, church. He's going to speak of suffering for their faith. He's going to speak of grumbling that's happening in the church. People love to grumble. We've talked about that. It's a cancer. It's a disease that spreads. Attitudes are very contagious. When you have a grumbling, complaining attitude and you start to share that with others, it spreads, it spreads, it spreads. No. There's hard things in life. We acknowledge those, but we are not grumblers and complainers. We praise God. And he gives, at the end of chapter 2, he gives two examples, Timothy and Epaphroditus, examples of those who live this way because we need examples. We desperately need examples. Listen to what he says in 2, 29 and 30. Speaking of Epaphroditus, who had brought the gift to Paul. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Epaphroditus nearly died. He risked his life. And Paul says, receive him with joy. This man is, is an example to us. And we've talked about this, but you need examples and you need to be an example. Other people look to you, whether you believe it or not. There's always somebody looking to you. You're an example whether you accept it or not to someone. The question is, what type of example are you? Do people see Christ in you? Do they see a person when they sin, they're quick to repent, to acknowledge sin, to say, I'm sorry, to go to a brother in Christ and say, I've offended you, I've hurt you, I'm sorry. What type of example they see? Because in chapter 3, Paul's going to hold himself up as an example. Now, for some of us, that feels a little arrogant. Look at me. And Paul says that. He says, look at me, but look at the Christ in me. I was a wretched man who wanted to kill Christians, who stood at the death of Stephen. But I'm redeemed by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Look to me as an example. And you see, as you realize that you're an example to others, you realize your life really is not your own. You are bought with a price. Your life's not your own. Your life is lived for His glory and other people look to you. That's how we live as Christians. And Paul says, 
He is an example. Look to him. He speaks of the Judaizers in this chapter. So he speaks of two big problems with this church. One is inside. There's the vision from these grumbling women. Secondly, out there, there's this group called the Judaizers who are saying, if you're a Christian, well, then you've got to do these other things first. You've got to be Jewish first. And Paul says, it's Christ plus nothing. There's nothing else to add to your faith. Jesus is enough. While our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ is deep and rich, it's also amazingly simple. Christ meets every need you have. Every longing of your heart is found fulfilled in Christ. So when we're in a situation where we have longings and desires, look to Christ. He's the one who meets those. He's the one who, who will do that. And, and look at verse 17 of chapter 3, what Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul says, watch me and also watch other faithful Christians. Christian, you need other Christians in your life. You desperately need it. They're not going to be perfect, but you need people that are investing in you, encouraging you, challenging you in your faith. Die that you can be a Christian alone and on an island, you won't grow very well. No, you need other people. People need you. You need other people. I would encourage you, seek that out. Pursue that. Pursue relationship, deep, rich relationship with others. That's what we're called to do. And in chapter 4, Paul has just spoken of their citizenship in heaven, and he starts to speak his final words in chapter 4 to this uh, church. He says, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my crown and joy, stand firm. And that's what he ends in, stand firm. And he gives them how you stand firm. Remember, we've talked about this. Don't be anxious about anything. Everything, prayer, petition, with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's a key. And then Paul tells us to set our mind on things above. And then he gives thanks for the church in Philippi. And he begins to end the book by telling them that they had shared in his trouble. Have you ever had someone share in hardship with you? Think how special that is. Someone who's there in the difficult times. And that's what the church in Philippi has been. In fact, they sent him out as a missionary and took care of him. And he said, even when he went to Thessalonica, the only church that I would say could rival the church in Philippi is Thessalonica. And that church probably wouldn't have been planted if it wasn't for the church in Philippi that sent Paul out with a gift to go there. Now, it speaks down here that Paul doesn't seek the gift that they brought, but he, they get credit. He seeks the blessing they get. And in verse 19, he says something wonderful. Chapter 4. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. Here's what he says. Christian, God will meet your need. It's an assurance. But here's how you activate the assurance. This church is sacrificially giving. They are giving to the point that they have no more to give. And Paul tells them, when you live that way, God will meet your need. It doesn't take long to drive the streets of our city to realize there's a lot of need. People hungry, people have need. But as a Christian, we don't have to fear whether our needs will be met or not. We have an assurance that our needs will be met. And as we give joyfully, generously, sacrificially, God gives us assurance that he'll meet this. This isn't some prosperity idea, give to the Lord and he'll give you back everything you want. No, this is give to the Lord, give generously, and God will meet your need. Don't say he'll meet your greed or everything you want. And in verse 20, Paul says, he, he gives a prayer to God, our Father, be glory forever and ever, amen, a doxology of sorts here. And then he ends the book much like he starts it. 
Tell him to greet every saint, especially those in Caesar's house. And as I mentioned, I love that verse. Those in Caesar's house had come to know the Lord through Paul's chains. How is God going to use the difficulties you go through, the challenges? Some of the greatest examples in my life have been those who've walked through hard times clinging to the Lord, trusting in the Lord in the midst of that, finding their joy in the Lord. You see, the three big ideas of this book that we've been covering, joy, don't believe the lie that it's based on your circumstances, it's based on Christ and Christ alone. Unity, remember we asked the question, are you a threat to unity in the church? Most of us would say no, but the reality is, is every single one of us is a threat to unity in the church. The enemy wants to deceive you and then use you to bring division. You think you're doing good, but you're bringing division. And yes, church, there are things to divide over. The word of God, nature of Christ, he's the only way to salvation. But often we divide over things that aren't like that. And one of the keys to unlocking these is thankfulness. Be a thankful person. Paul is writing a thank you note, encouraging them to be thank you for, that's how you deal with anxiety. And all of these can only be rooted in Christ. You can only experience them as you have them rooted in Christ. We have things to be anxious about. There's an election tomorrow. We don't know the results. We don't know how things are gonna turn out. We don't know the responses. There's areas of unrest here in Ethiopia, but we can have joy in the midst of those challenges because of Jesus Christ. Church, may we be filled with joy, may we be unified, and may we be thankful. I pray the book of Philippians has blessed you as it's blessed my heart and soul. And I pray that for each of us, we'd find greater fulfillment and satisfaction and joy in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I do thank you for your word. Your word is good, it's true, we can stand on it. And Lord, I pray that we would be a joyous people. Joyous because our joy is found in Christ, not in circumstances. Oh Lord, we, we're quick, we confess that circumstances often disrupt us, often bring anxiety, often bring fear. They do in my life. But Lord, may we turn to you and find our hope in you. May we be those who unify, who bring greater unity to places. May we be a, a breath of peace when we walk into a place because we have the peace of Christ. May we be grateful. May we be thankful people because we know that this world is hard, yet our security is in Christ. So Lord, use us as you see fit. Lord, if there's any here today that have not trusted you, I pray that they would. And for those who need to repent of our sin, Lord, that's every one of us. I pray that you'd reveal to us that which we need to repent of. And Lord, as we sing this last song, may you reveal to us your beauty, glory, and grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.